Hi everyone, today I'm talking to Guy Cohen about finding the ground state energy level of different quantum systems using machine learning approaches. I hope you enjoy our discussion. Hey Guy, thank you very much for taking the time today. Hey. So we have the paper on the screen here that we're going to be talking about. It's called Stochastic Representation of Many-Body Quantum States. Would you mind giving a brief introduction to what made you write that paper um, and the considerations that just led up to it? Yeah, sure. So, so for me, this paper was uh, uh, it essentially came out of uh, playing with uh, machine learning as a toy over the last few years. Uh, I was, uh, you know, th this is not my field. I don't really, I haven't really done any uh, uh, research in machine learning or AI until recently, uh, but it seemed like a fun toy to play with. It seems like the technology is really nice and easy to use at this point, and uh, uh, essentially I was thinking that uh, maybe we could uh, uh, do something with it. And one of the first ideas that came to mind, uh, and that is what eventually led to this paper by Christiana mostly, uh, is the idea that these machine learning things are essentially a nice high-tech way of doing interpolation. Uh, and I think that that's not, uh, right, it's not controversial that, uh, that deep learning is, is quite good at doing interpolation. Uh, the thing which is maybe not fully well understood is, uh, is maybe why, right? Mm -hmm. People have an idea that somehow functions that are somehow good or useful are on a low dimensional manifold of function space and then by, by using a neural network you're somehow magically able to fit them uh, with a, an amount of data that doesn't increase exponentially with the dimension of your system. Uh, and what, what I had in mind was, okay, in a way th this is exactly what you want in order to do many body quantum mechanics. Can we uh, translate the problem of doing uh, quantum mechanics, or at least representing uh, uh, the state of a system in quantum mechanics as just an interpolation problem. And uh, uh, this grew out of that, and uh, the kinds of pictures that I was drawing were, uh, imagine that you have a, a wave function for something like the ground state of a 1D harmonic oscillator. Okay, so mm -hmm. this, is, this would basically be a Gaussian function. Uh, and you've sampled this function at a bunch of points. Now machine learning should be able to fit a, 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 a solid line through that. Mm -hmm. And hopefully a good solid line, uh, even if you don't have such good data. And if you can do that, if you have a representation of your function that is continuous and that you can take derivatives of, then you can apply a Hamiltonian to it. Uh, and by doing that, you can propagate an imaginary time maybe get a better uh, approximation for a ground state. Or you could propagate it in real time and uh, see dynamics. So, so mm -hmm. the main idea here was that the representation is actually just points in space and the value of the wave function at those points. And then you use machine learning to reinterpret that as a continuous function, which you can act on with various tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to characterize this problem, maybe just take a step back. Um, what we are looking to solve, let's say, with the application is we have some form of quantum system. The thing we're interested mm -hmm. in is acquiring the wave function for that system. And there are currently other approaches of doing that, as sure. my understanding. Would you mind giving some background as to um, what those ways of finding the wave function are and what their current limitations are? So what is the need for, for this yeah. new uh, area of investigation? So, so maybe, I mean, it's not a new area of investigation. I mean, this uh, literally goes back over 100 years. Uh, the, the, maybe I should start by clarifying what the problem is, right? Mm -hmm. So if, if you're thinking about the wave function of a quantum mechanical system, uh, with, with, which has many particles in it, right, many degrees of freedom, then, uh, 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 then, then let's compare that to a classical system, for instance. So suppose you have a bunch of classical particles in space. You know that if you know the coordinates of each of these particles and the velocities, then you can just solve Newton's equations and know what they'll do for the rest of eternity or what they've done in the past. 
Uh, and the state of the system is a set of, uh, right, in three dimensions, you have six numbers per particle. So for n particles, six n numbers. Uh, in quantum mechanics, you actually have a wave function. So you have to represent some function uh, of the coordinates of each of these particles. So if you have one particle in 3D, you have just a 3D function, which is not so bad. But if you have two particles, you have a six-dimensional particle. And if you have ten particles, you have a 30-dimensional function. And representing a high-dimensional function on a computer, uh, and certainly analytically, but even on a computer, that becomes exponentially expensive uh, as that dimension increases. Mm -hmm. So this is what, in machine learning, you would call the curse of dimensionality. That's, that's how it comes about in quantum anybody physics. And that's actually you know, one of the main things that's special about quantum mechanics in, in comparison to classical mechanics, that really it's high dimensional physics. Mm -hmm. Now, once you realize that, the question is, how can you efficiently work with this very many dimensional wave function, right? So, so what, what does it mean to find the wave function, right? A wave function can be anything, it's just the state of the system, but you're usually interested in specific wave functions. So in chemistry and in a lot of condensed matter physics, uh, uh, the, the, let's say the most interesting wave function that you're often looking for is the ground state, the wave function that has the lowest energy. And we know uh, really, from uh, uh, you know the, the early 20th century, that if you just have a guess for a wave function, if I just make up a function, uh, then I can calculate what is called a variational energy for it. I can calculate uh, what would be like if you take that wave function, you make a zillion copies of it, and you make a zillion experiments, and each one of them you measure the energy. You would generally get a different answer each time. Uh, but the mean answer you would get, the average of all those experiments, would have to be larger than the ground state energy unless you've somehow exactly guessed the ground state energy. Mm -hmm. So if you have this variational energy for a guess for the wave function, uh, you can, if, if you find now a guess that has a lower energy, then you're sort of uh, guaranteed to be in, in some sense closer to the ground state. And it's guaranteed that you can't go too far, right? With, with certain restrictions that have to do with the with symmetries, for instance. But uh, you you can't have a guess that has an energy that's too low, if you've obeyed certain physical constraints, at least. Mm -hmm. So is that the description of variational Monte Carlo, or is, are that, we talking so that, about that some would other be a very, very, So that, that's a variational method, the Ritz variational method, and it mm -hmm. precedes Monte Carlo. So people okay. were doing this like analytically on paper with polynomials uh, uh, long before you had Monte Carlo methods, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, you know with 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 functions that were analytically treatable, uh, integrals that you could solve on paper and so on. And then uh, you know a big a big advance was that you could take more general functions, and in order to calculate this variational energy, what you have to do is you have to do right this this three n dimensional system. You have to do a three n dimensional integral over uh, the entire space, uh, calculate something, right? The action of a Hamiltonian on a wave function and so on. And, and uh, uh, the result of that uh, integral will be the, the variational energy. And now you can do that with Monte Carlo uh, in an unbiased way uh, and get an energy up to within some stochastic error. And that turns out to be you know, the best way we know uh, again, some caveats, but the best generic way we know to do very high dimensional integrals. So what variational Monte Carlo will do is you take a guess for the wave function which has a bunch of parameters, and this is what in machine learning you would call the, the you know the theta vector, right? The, the set of parameters that define your network, uh, and uh, you calculate the energy for it at a, by, by by doing a calculation at a set number of samples in space. So you mm -hmm. sample points in space uh, out of this integral and you evaluate a stochastic uh, approximation for this integral. You get a variational energy and then you take a gradient with respect to that uh, and try to go to a lower energy. Try to mm -hmm. have a function, try to, to generate a new function with new parameters that will have a lower energy. So that would be uh, a kind of gradient descent procedure. Right. 
and this minimization, you're, you're sort of guaranteed that you can't go too far. As you do what do you this, mean when you say you can't go too far in that context? So, so it means you can't get an energy that is too low. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fine. Right. At least up to within some stochastic error. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay so but that, it's still that, that, you. You might still encounter local minima on the way. Is yeah, that a, exactly. a problem so, with the approach? So now, okay. now the question is right. You, you can certainly get energy that is too high, mm -hmm. and in a way, you have this very high-dimensional space of functions now, and you're trying to move along in this space of function and find find you know, a set of functions that are a good description for mm -hmm. this uh, mysterious ground state that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you have no idea how close you are, really. You just have an energy, and you know if you go down in energy. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this landscape is often very rugged. So you get trapped in these local minima, and then uh, uh, you, you are unable to find a good approximation for the ground state, even if actually your network is good enough to express that. Even if you have an expressive model, uh, the optimization doesn't work very well. Mm -hmm. okay, so what, what people then do is something that is called either uh, natural gradient descent in the machine learning literature or uh, stochastic reconfiguration in the variation of Monte Carlo literature, which mm -hmm. means instead of doing the gradient descent in parameter space, you kind of go to function space. So okay. you try to shift the function kind of smoothly in space, and we have procedures for doing that. Uh, and then you're, you're more or less, I would say, you're, you're almost guaranteed to get a good uh, uh, estimate for the ground state to within what your uh, network is able, or your model is able to fit. However, that procedure is quite expensive because you have to... Uh, you have to do a transformation from parameter space to function space, which means uh, inverting a very large matrix. Mm -hmm. And that matrix is the size of the, say, the number of parameters, right? That's its dimension. So in right. modern machine language, you know, there are models with uh, uh, millions or billions of parameters even, and that is completely unfeasible. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I take it correctly then, in the transformation between a parameter-based approach and then a function-based approach, you're trying to, I mean, you're converting the parameters to a function and then in the selection procedure of the new function, you're trying to select something that changes, like, what is the, um, is there a conceptual reason why mm -hmm. optimizing the functions instead or iterating over the function approximations would be more stable than iterating over the parameters? So I get that that would be an alternative approach. It seems to yeah. me like all the problems you would have with optimizing the parameters would be, let's say, amplified by trying to optimize the function instead, because to me, at least, it seems like you have more degrees of, um, of freedom in trying to optimize that function. Do you have a good explanation for why that kind of approach, albeit very expensive, conceptually is more stable than, than the alternative? Yeah. So... So the way that we think about it in physics, right, uh, is actually quite clear. And this is called imaginary time propagation. Mm -hmm. So if you think about uh, uh, your guess for the wave function, right, your variational wave function, you can always write that as a sum over all the eigenvalues of your Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. right? So these are things that have a set energy. And I think you'll probably find this uh, somewhere here. Right, there we go. I think you're talking about this equation, right? Yeah, Number so this four? is equation okay. four. Mm -hmm. So uh, even if you don't know these uh, wave functions, right, finding them is kind of your target and it's difficult, you can formally write this thing. Mm -hmm. and now, if you apply an operator, which is like uh, the exponent of minus tau times the Hamiltonian to this thing, then you know what will happen, right? Each one will receive a factor, which is like the exponent of minus tau times the energy of that mm -hmm. state. And then what happens is that all of these things, right, all your coefficients will decay exponentially, all your functions will decay exponentially, but the ground state, which has the lowest energy, will decay uh, uh, the slowest. Mm -hmm. So everything decays faster than the ground state. Okay. So by doing this procedure, uh, if you repeat it a bunch of times, and each time you normalize your wave function so that you don't just get zero, Mm -hmm. then eventually the only thing that you'll be left with is the ground state. Mm -hmm. 
So conceptually, okay. we expect that to work. It's not really minimization, right? This is more controlled. This is a, this is a procedure by which if we have a guess, we now mm -hmm. construct a guess that has a, a higher proportional coefficient for the ground state than mm -hmm. my previous guess. Okay, understood. So yeah. maybe since we're looking at the paper already, we can have a look at the actual algorithm that you're proposing. So it's outlined here in the beginning of the results. Yeah. Um, there are five steps, or really four steps, uh, considering that the fifth is a repetition of the previous four. Would you mind describing on a high level what happens in this updated algorithm that you're now proposing? And then we can maybe dig into some more details of those steps. Yeah, so, so the idea is, uh, uh, right, as, as an alternative to doing this variation on Monte Carlo, which I think, right, I, I hope I've explained uh, uh, you know, clearly enough that you get the general idea, uh, we do something else. So we, uh, just like in variational Monte Carlo, we start with a guess for the wave function. Mm. Uh, and we sample, what that guess might be could be uh, a, an easy problem to solve, right? Uh, a system without many body interactions, which you can solve exactly, a mean field solution, or maybe just a random function, right? That, that'll mm -hmm. often work too. Uh, and we take that function and we sample it at a bunch of points, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, so, so these are coordinates of particles. So each point uh, is characterized by, uh, in three dimensions, say, three n numbers. Mm -hmm. And there's a value of my guess for the wave function at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that okay, corresponds so to, have... let's say, this part of the um, of right, step number yeah. one, right? So R, in this case, just for anyone watching as well, is the coordinates of that system. And then um, phi of R or psi of R is the um, wave function value for, or the sample wave right. function value for that point. Right. Mm -hmm. And and from a machine learning data science perspective, you can think of these as, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can think of the psi as labels, right? And of the mm -hmm. R's as uh, uh, essentially uh, features, mm -hmm. right? So you take this set of uh, features and labels and you try to learn a function. So essentially mm -hmm. what you're doing now is uh, regression. Mm -hmm. Okay, now there is one step that we do before that, which is step two, uh, which has to deal with, uh, uh, right, with, with a little bit of physics, right? In many particle physics, when we have identical particles, we know that they come in two types, right? You have fermions and bosons. Right. And fermions have to be anti-symmetric to particle exchange. So if I take, you know, if I have a system of, uh, you know, uh, say two particles, and I have their wave function, and now I exchange the two, mm -hmm. uh, I know my wave function has to change sign. Mm -hmm. And if I change them back, uh, it'll change sign back to the original wave function. Uh, right. If I have three particles and I change these two, it'll flip, right? So, so this, this anti-symmetry has to be obeyed for fermions. There's a similar rule for bosons, right? So fermions are, are particles like uh, electrons, uh, 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 let's say protons, a lot of the important particles in, in, in condensed matter physics, but say photons uh, are bosons. Mm -hmm. And when you exchange two photons, the wave function stays the same. Right. Okay, so it's symmetric to particle exchange. And it turns out that all elementary particles in nature are either fermions or bosons, right? We don't have anything else. Uh, you can build, say, complex quasi-particles that are more general than that, but uh, these are the basic exchange rules. So, so given that, right, uh, we can actually use this uh, uh, stochastic representation to apply symmetrization or anti-symmetrization. And the way that we do that is just by data augmentation. So if we have a point in space and a wave function there, then we can generate uh, many other points in space where we've just uh, permuted pairs of particles and we've flipped the wave function, we've flipped the sign according to the number of permutations that we've done. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can sample that space and if we have n particles, then we have n factorial possible things. So there's a lot of free data that you can get. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you do that, then you're sort of guaranteed to get a function that is closer to the uh, symmetric or anti-symmetric function that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So we call that okay. stochastic projection. 
Uh, and I should say that we have, uh, let's say, other ways of handling this. You can put this explicitly into the ansatz. Uh, now we do it by sorting. Uh, uh, so, so there are all sorts of things we can do, but, uh, but th this is kind of a simple data augmentation approach to getting that anti-symmetry. And it's important, <laughs> if you don't do that, you will basically always get the bosonic solution because that's the lowest energy. Mm -hmm. One quick follow-up question on that. Yeah. So let's say you have a system where you have a mix of bosons and, and fermions. In yeah. this data augmentation step, do you only switch, let's say, the fermions individually and then the, the bosons individually as well? Um, or is there any way to, let's say, leverage the, the overall constellation of the system, but then to, to flip, let's say, a fermion and a boson? Or do you simply yeah, ignore those so, kinds of question, mixtapes? Right. So, so fermions and bosons can't be the same particles. So I could never uh, exchange a fermion with a boson and get uh, uh, the same wave function. I would expect that to be something completely different. But I can yeah. exchange any two identical fermions or identical bosons, and I know what that should do to the sign. So yeah. anything like that is possible. And okay. in fact, if you look at things like molecules, then you would have spin configurations, uh, and you would have, let's say, uh, fermions with one spin or the other spin, and you might flip them with each other, and uh, it's, uh, you know you could have more complex scenarios. But mm -hmm. I, right, let's say the simplest case is everything is symmetric and everything is anti-symmetric, but you could have other uh, situations. Mm -hmm. Okay, understood. Yeah, where, where generally you would have to add spin degrees of freedom, and uh, well, let's, uh, then your wave function would not be just a single function; it would be some sort of spinner, it would be a vector with uh, different components. But mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that's a different uh, issue. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so that's stochastic projection, and that's, that's quite nice. Uh, that kind of technique will let you actually apply other symmetries if you want. So if you have spatial symmetries or things like that, then you can uh, uh, work with this to, to use data augmentation to do that. Again, mm -hmm. it may or may not be the best way to do it. Mm -hmm. Is there a way, okay. sorry for interrupting again, but is there a way to determine that in an algorithmic sense? Like given that you have some form of constellation that you're looking to find the wave function for, um, is it easy? Like do we have mm -hmm. well-established techniques for identifying such symmetries and then uh, applying some form of augmentation as a result? Or would that be something you treat at least as per the current state from one problem to the next? Well, uh, my, my so, so okay, so you have systems with symmetries in the Hamiltonian then you might have, say, emergent symmetries, symmetries that you don't know about in advance. So the latter, uh, I could kind of guess or look at the data and, and try, to, uh, try to enforce them. Mm -hmm. But generally, uh, I, I think I normally wouldn't want to, unless I'm, I'm particularly looking for something. Uh, the former, I, I kind of know about in advance from the physics. So fermion mm -hmm. anti-symmetry is something I always know about. And if I know that a Hamiltonian has a certain symmetry, then you know, I, could, I could enforce that symmetry. Mm -hmm. and that, that doesn't require any knowledge about the wave function. That, right, the, the wave function, essentially we know that the ground state wave function has to obey all the symmetries of the Hamiltonian. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So the next step uh, uh, is where we do the regression, right? So now I have a bunch of points in space. Some of them are, say, the original points that I calculated somehow, and some of them are points from this data augmentation technique. Mm -hmm. And now I construct a new uh, machine learning function, or ANSATS, we would call it in variational uh, calculations, uh, by essentially doing regression. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is kind of nice. So, so this is the only place where we use machine learning. The only actual gradient descent that is done is to, say, minimize the least squares distance between the function, your model function, and your set of data points. So it's all supervised learning. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and, and that, I guess that that's equation quite... number three as well, right? This one? Uh, yes, yeah. So that, that mm -hmm. would be like my cost function, the thing that I'm trying to minimize. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially, you know, given a set of data points, I, I, I kind of know how good I am, and I can always add more data. Uh, and I can systematically improve it in a, in a bunch of ways. Okay, so, so this is kind of the heart of the technique, because once you do this, then you have a function that you can do anything you want with, and in particular, what we're going to do 
is uh, uh, what you see in equation one below, right? Given that model function, which is a uh, which has a bunch of parameters, we will apply uh, locally e to minus tau uh, delta tau times the Hamiltonian to that to get a bunch of sample points, new sample points that have been propagated in imaginary time. Mm -hmm. Okay, so given a continuous function, a model for a continuous function. I can get a new set of samples which represent some unknown function which has a lower energy. And then I can repeat. And that is essentially the end of the algorithm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I should say that uh, we found this out uh, uh, very briefly after publication, but uh, this, this idea of doing, uh, uh, let's say, replacing time propagation by, uh, by a regression step mm -hmm. or doing optimization by imaginary time evolution and regression has appeared in some uh, earlier papers in the literature from a few mm -hmm. years earlier. Mm -hmm. So there are papers that appear almost simultaneously by uh, Giuseppe Carleo and by Brian Clark which do this for lattice systems. Okay, so it's a different kind of uh, uh, system. Uh, it can actually be used to describe the same physical problems, but in a very different way. It can be more efficient or less efficient, depends on the, uh, the idea. But uh, I'll say, I would say that much of the core of this idea is there, even though you don't have this picture of uh, drawing points in space and fitting lines through them, there is something quite similar. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if I understand correctly, um, in the last step where we apply this time propagation, we have now already fitted and updated um, onsets. So we have yeah. an updated function based on the data points that we sample. We take that function and then we apply mm -hmm. this transformation to it, which gives us essentially an updated function. And that's then the function that we would again go back to step number one and sample from in order to get our next iteration of right. the algorithm. Right, exactly. Okay. Yeah. okay, good. So every step you're sort of correcting the symmetry a little bit. Uh, and every step you're trying to find functions uh, that are of a lower energy. And mm -hmm. if you repeat that a few times, you should eventually find something that's, uh, you know, that, that uh, with respect to the number of times, grows exponentially close to the, uh, to the ground state, mm -hmm. barring things like uh, stochastic errors and uh, uh, model uh, uh, limitations and so on. Mm -hmm. And then with this algorithm, I guess for bosonic systems, and we can maybe have a look at the function related to this later, I guess for bosonic systems you would have the same kind of guarantee that you mentioned earlier for variational Monte Carlo, that you're not able to, let's say, go below the lowest or right. the minimal energy yeah. system, but that's not necessarily true for fermions then, I take in, right. in this kind of application. Exactly, because, because a fermionic ground state is only a ground state given a certain uh, anti-symmetry constraint. Mm -hmm. So you can always add a small component of this lower uh, boson ground state and lower the energy. Mm -hmm. So you have to be careful about uh, correctly anti-symmetrizing your wave function or you will get an energy that is not uh, variational, that is actually too low. Mm -hmm. My understanding mm -hmm. for from some of these previous approaches, so variational Monte Carlo being one example, is that's, um, let's say, hard-coded, for lack of a better word, that understanding of, of the, this kind of symmetry. Um, right. Is there a particular reason why in this algorithm you chose not to, to do something equivalent and have this degree of freedom, let's say? Does it help the algorithm in some other way? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so there, there are two, two answers to it. One is uh, because we can, right? So because it actually works, it's actually kind of interesting to do so and to demonstrate mm -hmm. that you're able to, to apply this symmetry without knowing it in advance. That's, yep. that's maybe a methodological uh, kind of answer. Uh, the other answer is that uh, the way that it's typically done, that there are a few ways to uh, enforce anti-symmetry. Okay, symmetry is maybe a little bit easier, right? Uh, because you don't really have to enforce it. The, the optimization will find it by itself. Anti-symmetry is complicated in, in, in many ways. And the way that people do it in, say, uh, most traditional variational Monte Carlo is they use uh, what we call a Slater determinant. So mm -hmm. you actually describe, or, or say a generalization of that, but you describe your uh, wave function uh, in a form that is uh, uh, a determinant 
of some other functions of the coordinates. And that determinant has, uh, you know, a determinant has a property that if you exchange two, uh, uh, two rows, you will get a minus sign. So you set it up so that the coordinates are in rows, and then when you exchange two rows, you get this minus sign automatically. Mm -hmm. So by doing that, you guarantee that you have an anti-symmetric wave function, and you don't have this problem, and you don't need to do this uh, stochastic uh, projection thing at all. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, that has a few disadvantages too, right? So one is that you have to calculate this determinant. Okay, so determinant is not super expensive, but still it's like the number of particles cubed. And that scaling is, uh, you know, cubic scaling is uh, uh, nothing to, uh, to ignore. Uh, mm -hmm. There are maybe other techniques that can do it in quadratic scaling, but uh, uh, I would say they're not widely used at this point for, for different reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing is that if you think about this within the machine learning context, uh, uh, that, that these machines don't like... Uh, uh, jagged functions with lots of edges and uh, uh, sudden flips and things like that. That's not good for uh, automatic derivatives and for optimization and so on. So that may actually, you know, that we can't prove this, but one might suspect that that could cause difficulties in optimization. Mm -hmm. uh, and that probably wouldn't be an issue if you're doing uh, natural gradient descent, if you're doing imaginary time evolution. But uh, uh, with, with standard optimization that would be more of an issue mm -hmm. okay yes so i take it so, that so this is a general let's say interesting area, like interesting way of deriving the algorithm that has likely benefits we're not quite sure whether or not they uh yeah. manifest themselves in, in very measurable ways yet but nevertheless um yeah and okay. I, I should say that we have yeah, we, that there's no paper about this yet but there will be very soon we have uh, another technique that is uh, kind of neither of these things uh, but that requires uh, replacing the, the way that we do imaginary time propagation by path integration. So mm -hmm. once we do this with Feynman path integrals, uh, then we get a little bit more freedom in terms of the, the functions that we can use here and uh, uh, the kinds of constraints that we have in the way that we apply symmetry. And then we have better techniques of doing this. So I would mm -hmm. say that, well, this is, uh, this is cool and, uh, you know, I'm I was glad to see that it works. I, I don't think that as it is, it'll scale without, let's say, uh, uh, telling the model something, without putting something in the model architecture that makes it easier to scale. And in a way, I, I could just uh, you know, throw that problem onwards to computer science and say, okay, look, we have this problem. Maybe you guys can come up with uh, uh, machine learning architectures that are good at it. Uh, but... Uh, and that, that, that might be the best way uh, because some of this philosophy of deep learning is that you should do as little as possible in your model. Mm -hmm. right? You should have just a model that, is, that, that knows very little and uh, 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 let it learn everything. And those are kind of the most impressive uh, uh, algorithms that we see so far. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're also very expensive. So, uh, right. so there, there's sort of a trade-off between, uh, let's say, algorithmic freedom and, uh, uh, and applying constraints in advance. Mm -hmm. And we as don't we're know talking, what, what is best. As we're talking about the field in general, would you say the problems with representing these kinds of systems are at the moment most inherently linked to computational constraints? Or that we're not able to find algorithms that converge appropriately to those kinds of systems? Because I guess that question plays a big role in, in considering what kind of, um, what kind of structures would be uh, yeah, uh, potent for, for these problems. Yeah, so, so I, I mean, it's a, uh, it, it's a very large field. There's yeah. a large variety of methods for doing quantum many body physics. Uh, most of my work is on other methods where we don't even work with the wave functions at all, we work with uh, uh, what physicists call Green's functions, correlation mm -hmm. functions of a sort. Uh, and then we don't have this exponential problem, we have other problems. Uh, we have to work with the perturbation theory and, and Feynman diagrams and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. There are, I uh, say, closely related to these variational techniques, to variational Monte Carlo, we have things like diffusion Monte Carlo. 
or if you start with a guess from the wave for the wave function and you sort of know where its nodes are where the wave function goes to zero or changes sign then you can uh, without uh, an explicit representation for the wave function for the final wave function you can get a, a good variational estimate for the energy mm-hmm. and uh, uh, I, I would say that there's one set of techniques that has to do with just finding the Good representations of wave functions and efficiently manipulating them in order to find uh, approximations of ground states or dynamical states with them and in this set of things what people have traditionally done you know they started by doing uh, Gaussian's times polynomials because you could do the integrals analytically then they moved on to uh, let's say more uh, more uh, general functions and But ones that were still easy to work with and to do Monte Carlo with and that had physics built into them and uh, uh, now people are trying to do this with neural networks because of this idea that they, they have a very high level of expressivity that with very few numerical parameters you can represent functions that are very complicated and have correlations across a very large number of dimensions. Mm-hmm. And that has been uh, you know has been successful to some degree like uh, mm-hmm. rather quickly these these methods have become state of the art for certain problems at least mm-hmm. I guess one big area of investigation or a sub area of investigation is what kind of architectures are actually appropriate for representing these kinds of systems when we're talking about neural networks I think for your investigation and maybe this is also relevant um, you used a neural network that was fully connected right uh, or yeah. what kind of architecture did you use for this and do you have some comments on, on maybe what what is emerging in the field in terms of appropriate representations yeah so we, we did essentially the dumbest thing possible uh, which is just uh, you know the, the a child's uh, neural network so it's just a bunch of layers I believe they're all the same uh, width uh, and they're densely connected. Uh, this is not uh, let's say a, a leading uh, a modern representation in many things but it worked for us uh, it worked well enough and we didn't really uh, feel a need to play with it too much what mm-hmm. is the best representation I don't know so so I talk to people who actually know what they're doing in machine learning and mm-hmm. they tell me there have been a lot of advances in uh, uh, representing uh, neural fields for instance uh, and there are architectures that are especially suited to that and that they do these uh, rather amazing things you know with very few parameters usually what they're interested in is something like graphics compression right so you have a 3d function and you want to fit it with a, a very small number of parameters mm-hmm. uh, uh, so you start from a point cloud and essentially you do uh, uh, something like interpolation so it looks a lot like what we're doing it's 3d rather than uh, uh, high dimensional and Uh, but the, the let's say the level of detail and, and uh, uh, contrast that you see here is, is quite high mm. so it's I, I think it's very possible that uh, you know some something more modern uh, based on convolutional neural networks or diffusion models or I, I don't know what will do a lot better in this and I'm trying to get uh, computer science people interested in this because again what we've done is extremely naive and it's it's uh, I would say it's rather surprising that it's worked so well Mm-hmm. okay maybe for the last part we can transition to some of the results that you have in the paper as well um, so I'm sharing on the screen now one figure one of the the introductory ones I would say uh, of yeah. well if we start at the top here uh, if you just want to explain what this well figure 1a here represents yeah so so what I'm showing is something that I was showing maybe with hand waving before right mm-hmm. solving uh, the first problem of Uh, or maybe not the first but let's say uh, the third or fourth problem that you would learn in undergraduate quantum mechanics uh, the quantum harmonic oscillator okay right. so this is if you have a particle one particle in one dimension uh, and it uh, lives in a parabola mm-hmm. okay so the wave function for that is a Gaussian that is shown as the dashed red line here the exact mm-hmm. solution here Yep. And what we do is we start with uh, a guess which is the green line on the left. okay a very bad guess has the wrong symmetry. Uh, it has a node which it shouldn't have. Uh, but still we do that. And then these uh, vertical black lines point to samples. So mm-hmm. we have a bunch of samples of that function. 
uh, we show a subset of these samples. We mostly concentrate them around the peaks where the function is big, but we also have some elsewhere. And then we fit a function, we fit a continuous function, which is that green line, to those, and that, that's going to be our first guess. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then as you go to the right, we are essentially doing a set of uh, imaginary time propagation steps, trying to get closer to the exact wave function. So the middle uh, 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 set of panels, mm -hmm. the middle panel is uh, basically, you know, after a short propagation, you see that it gets a little bit better. And the right one is after a pretty long propagation where you see that it's already quite close to the ground state, at least in terms of shape and symmetry and so on, and it's lost the node and uh, all this. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of very, very basic minimal demonstration that the idea works, that you mm -hmm. can actually do this and uh, it, it gives you correct results. Mm -hmm. uh, and then below that in panel B, uh, you know, we, we look at the actual variational energy compared to Right, this is for an exactly solvable problem, so we know what we should get. And we see uh, uh, here we have a fermionic problem. So this is uh, two fermions and two D. Mm -hmm. And we start with some guess uh, at tau equals zero, which is just you know ridiculously high energy. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we propagate that in time. And you can see that briefly we get an energy that's actually too low. Mm -hmm. So the first step actually uh, brings you towards the bosons, which have a much lower energy. Mm -hmm. Then stochastic, uh, stochastic uh, uh, projection will fix that. You'll go too high again. And then you'll start going down towards the ground state. And you can see that it stabilizes at the correct fermionic ground state. It doesn't, uh, let's say, go down to the boson state. Mm -hmm. And okay. you can see in the insets are... Uh, let's say 2D planes, right, 2D cuts through this four-dimensional function. Because you have two particles in 2D, so it's a four-dimensional function. I can't really draw it, but mm -hmm. I can show you some, uh, let's say, pieces of it at different times. Mm -hmm. And if you know what you're looking for, you'll see that essentially you very quickly get anti-symmetry correctly from it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this one then, just for uh, so I understand it correctly, is technically speaking a lower energy system and you can see that also in the in the corresponding wave function that it seems to take on the shape of something like what we would have here um, but it violates the constraints that would be necessary for a right. fermionic system yeah mm -hmm. so it has it okay. has a large component of the bosonic ground state uh, which is right. just a much lower energy so you mm -hmm. see that it goes to right it, it's minimizing it's, it's doing what it's supposed to do in terms mm -hmm. of the imaginary time evolution but it's, it's too low, and you need to correct it to enforce the symmetry. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if I wanted the boson solution, then I would just not do that, and uh, we'll go to the boson solution. And I think we see right. a demonstration of that below. Mm -hmm. uh, just one question on the figure here in relation to the actual algorithm that we discussed before. So we have these five steps in the algorithm, and yeah. they then, as you explained, tie very well into the, the story that we painted here with uh, figure 1a. Um, very naively from my perspective, we have, let's say, in the intermediary step here, a function that we've approximated. If we go through the algorithm and the steps associated with that once again, we now generate new samples from this. Um, if we have some form of symmetry or anti-symmetry, we would take that into account and, and generate more data points as a consequence of it. And then we would do function approximation again on these points and then do imaginary time evolution. So it right. seems like the bulk to me, of the work is being done by the imaginary time evolution. What is the... Right. So here, this is one is particle and one D, right? So there's no symmetry mm -hmm. or anti-symmetry. Right. And what is then the need for, let's say, the new sampling of additional points from, from the updated function, and then also uh, the leveraging, let's say, of this anti-symmetry and then refitting of a function? It seems like you know, at first sight, it seems like those three steps are sort of unnecessary in the entire process. You have a function that seemingly the um, bulk of what you're doing is you're evolving that in imaginary time. What is the actual need in a figure like this for having the first three steps? And why wouldn't it work to, to simply take this original function that we have somewhere halfway here and just do imaginary time evolution on that? Right. So that's a good question. Uh, so now the, the question is how you actually do imaginary time evolution. Uh, so uh, there, there are a few ways to do that. The way that we choose here, which is quite simple, is we take uh, this operator, e to minus tau h, and we expand it. You see that in equation 5, 
as 1 minus tau h. Right, so we take just the uh, first two terms in a Fourier series. Mm -hmm. And that will only work for small imaginary time slices. So you have to do a sequence of small steps for this to work correctly. You okay. could also take uh, higher order terms in this Fourier series. But actually what a Hamiltonian does when a Hamiltonian operates on a real space wave function, uh, right? You, you may remember from your uh, physics education that it has a kinetic energy term which takes a second derivative. Right? It has mm -hmm. a Laplacian operator. So you have yeah. to take Laplacians of that function. And machine learning uh, likes taking first derivative. Okay? Th these are popular because you need them for gradient descent. Mm -hmm. It doesn't like taking second derivatives. Many of the popular ansatzes uh, just have them zero everywhere or almost everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it certainly doesn't like taking fourth derivatives and higher order derivatives and things like that. So mm -hmm. you would have to have a very smooth function for that to work. Okay. Uh, and that, uh, that is problematic. Uh, the way that we do that now, we do the same operation of imaginary time uh, propagation by path integration. So essentially, uh, we, we start from a, a function. Uh, we want the function, let's say this is imaginary time, we want uh, the wave function at this point at a later time. So what we can do is we can uh, start with points in space for the original function and then sort of do a random walk, right? do a bunch of paths in time uh, to the uh, final point that we want to go to. And for each of these we have an action that we sum up. Okay, if we do a little Monte Carlo over these paths, right? integrate over possible paths, that all the particles could traverse to go from one uh, set of coordinates to another set of coordinates uh, with the appropriate actions, we uh, get an estimate for what the new wave function is. Mm -hmm. And that will actually work over a longer period, over a larger tau. Okay? Right. So, so then you could think of just doing this whole thing in one step. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that would essentially be uh, a diffusion Monte Carlo uh, mm -hmm. with what's called... Uh, uh, node relaxation. Okay, if you okay. do that, then you have to keep track of uh, the phases of all these particles. And mm -hmm. you might have, let's say, a coordinate here with a positive sign and a coordinate here with a negative sign, and they would both add up to a point here, and they would almost cancel out. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then you would have to sum up many paths that essentially almost can cancel out. Mm -hmm. And you would get uh, what is called a sign problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so a sign problem in the uh, Monte Carlo techniques for quantum mechanics, or in quantum Monte Carlo techniques, means that as you try to do this Monte Carlo integral, uh, this integral is over very, very noisy data, and you're mm -hmm. trying to find this very small signal, which is, uh, uh, you know, the remnant out of many very large terms that cancel out. Mm -hmm. And that gets exponentially bad as you increase tau. Mm -hmm. Okay, so okay. you have this trade-off here between, right. right, if you do have a good way of doing tau, right, which mm -hmm. again is not in this paper, but it's perfectly possible, then you have a trade-off between increasing it and going to your final destination in one step, uh, and then you only need a representation of your first and final function. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe right, you can do a lot of things without a representation of the final function even, like you can measure energy without doing the fit here. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the trade-off is between that and the sign problem. And that is uh, an exponential trade-off in general. Exponential in what sense? So exponential in tau. So as okay. you make tau longer, it gets exponentially harder to get clean data on what the wave function should be. Okay. So then what it turns out that you do by using uh, this algorithm is you go a smaller step, maybe not very small, but intermediate, uh, so that your sign problem is not so bad yet. And then you stop here and you do a fit. Yeah. Okay. If you're able to represent the function here, which is better than the function at this earlier tau, mm -hmm. then now you can start again from here, right? And maybe go to a lower one. And your sign problem is not determined by the overall length that you went, but by the step size. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really where machine learning helps you here. By having mm -hmm. these intermediate representations, you have a cutoff on the sign problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that gives you an exponential advantage compared to just doing it in one step. Right. 
So I see that we're starting to approach the, the time limit. Um, before, before we close the interview, I would just like to ask whether there are any additional points of research, like areas mm -hmm. that you would like to take, the, the results that you identified in this paper, that you haven't mentioned already with, let's say, the upcoming research that's just around the corner. Uh, well, I think that this is, uh, uh, this is an interesting starting point, but it's not yet quite practical. Right. So uh, before we take this into doing a lot of real research, we have to do some work. And uh, you know, I mentioned some of the stuff that we're doing now with path integrals and with different ways of enforcing anti-symmetry. And uh, our, next, our next paper is going to be on uh, trying to use a technique like this to look at uh, uh, what is sometimes called Wigner molecules. So you have a bunch of electrons in space, uh, they repel each other, and when interactions are strong, they will form structures. Okay. We'll have some sort of spontaneous symmetry breaking, and they, they will form uh, some sort of structure that no longer has the full symmetry of the Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a really nice way of looking at that, because by using these very free neural networks, we're not enforcing anything in that structure. Mm -hmm. We don't put any biases into this. Or at least we don't put any explicit biases that we're aware of into this. Right. Uh, and that lets us really uh, uh, kind of explore this space of, uh, uh, of structures that could form as a result of many body interactions. And that, that's going to be our first application. Uh, in general, there are a lot of uh, methods out there for trying to do this. And uh, uh, in terms of the actual you know, numbers, Right, like the number of particles that we're able to do, the the system sizes, the complexity of the system. This is not competitive with the state of the art methods. So this is a very uh, you know this is very much an early kind of result. Mm -hmm. uh, whether this will actually be useful for you know solving quantum chemistry problems one day, I don't know yet. Uh, we'll have to see. But so far, I, I for me this is a fun. Uh, a fun technology to play with, and I think uh, it's been quite interesting. Good. Then I guess, as a conclusion for people watching, stay tuned on upcoming research to see <laughs> to see where the field yeah. goes, or not the field, but see where the where where these particular applications go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. Then, guy, I think we'll cut the interview here. Thank you very much for for taking the time to discuss. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>